Thank you all for joining the HKU Science Mock Lecture. So um, before the start um, of the lecture, so um, please be reminded again to mute your own voice and then to not to share any videos during the lecture. And then after the presentation of our teachers, there'll be Q&A sessions. So you may answer, uh, you may ask your questions um, via the group chat on Zoom. And then we'll pick two to three questions for our teachers to answer and respond. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? I need one or two responses. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good, good. Okay. Good, so let's try to go on. Um, as you can see on the screen, what we were talking about is, uh, we'll be talking about science, technology, and us. So what do I really want us to get from this talk? First and foremost, I want that at the end of this activity, you should be able to understand the science behind a smart material. So here we are getting an, a, a new word, smart material. Maybe some of you know what a smart material is. Secondly, I want you to appreciate how science and technology, technology can affect our everyday lives. Those are the two most important things I want you to get out of this talk and out of the demo we are going to have. But remember, we are in the science faculty, and it's our job to always encourage you to do science and to see how relevant science is. So that is why I think we, we should do this. Okay. Now, we're going to go ahead with an activity. It's a very simple activity. Some of you might have seen this activity. If you've seen it, fine. Then you are a step ahead and you should be able to explain to us what is happening. So let's go to, uh, to the activity. So in this activity, what do we need? We need a beaker, I have a plastic cup. We need some water, right? We need a spatula or a spoon, and then a white chemical, which I have here in this bottle. Right, so what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to put a little bit of this chemical, just about half or a quarter of a teaspoon into the beaker. Let me do two so we, at least we have a backup. I put another one here. And then next, I'm going to put a little bit of water. And then we observe what is going to happen. That's it. So we're supposed to stir, but really no need for that. It works fine on its own. So I allow to stand for about half a minute. So you find the two of them. Okay, we are told to invert this. Now you see what I've done. I've inverted both containers. Can you see? Now I want you to tell me what you observe. I want to hear from you guys. Just speak out, one or two or three people. What did you observe? Just tell me what you observed from the demonstration. The water didn't fall down. There's no water, right? There's no water anymore. Yes. Is this some magic or what? It's something with the chemical. Yeah, something with the chemical. What happened? It swallowed the water? It absorbed it. It absorbed it. Right. Very, very good. So. Very good use of words, absorption, absorbing the water. The next thing we're going to talk about is how does this happen? How does this happen? So let's go back to the, to the PowerPoint. Right. Okay, what explanation do you have for your observation? You said they absorb the water. How does this water lock, I'm giving it a strange name, water lock. The chemical is like a water lock. It locks the water, right? How does it work? What explanations can you give? So I want you to write down your thoughts and ideas. Put them down on a piece of paper. Then the next thing I want you to do is explain how such a simple idea could be of commercial value. In other words, how can you use this idea of this substance absorbing water 
and make some money out of it. How can it be a big money making venture for you? So can you think of some common uses of this material can be used for? Think of some uses that this material could be, uh, could be made to, to give you money from, okay? So share and compare your ideas with others. So now I want us to talk amongst ourselves for a few, uh, for a few minutes. So let's hear from you guys. Let, let's talk a little bit. Let's do a discussion here. I know it's a little bit awkward. We are not seeing each other, but these are the times. Times are really hard and complicated. So let's try to make a simple discussion. Tell me what you think. What explanation do you have for this absorption of water? In very simple terms, very simple language, so that everybody, even your grandma who is at home with you, so that she can understand. OK, over to you guys. I'm listening. Any ideas? How does it work? How does this substance work? What makes it to absorb water? Can anybody explain? Oh, OK, it's a drying agent. Well, you can use it as a drying agent, but I want us to explain the science behind it. We're talking about the first part. What makes, if you want to use it as a drying agent, what makes it to function as a drying agent? Why is this chemical able to function as a drying agent? Please, I encourage you to speak, not only typing your answers. Try to speak out. I like to hear the nice voices. Come on, say something. It causes a chemical reaction that produces um, only solids, like it reacts with water. Okay, so there's a type of reaction only with water, right? What would make this chemical so special that it would absorb the water? For example, if you put water into rice, rice doesn't absorb the water. You may leave it to stand there for some days, unless it, 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 the rice becomes moldy and mushy and then everything is mixed up. But this one is instantaneous. Immediately you put the water, it got absorbed by the, by the substance. What makes it so special? What makes it so different? One more idea, one more person. You what see the structure of the uh, powder. Okay. Maybe it's anhydrous. It's anhydrous? Yeah. What, what do you mean by anhydrous? It forms a complex with water. It forms some complex with water. So I'm getting so many ideas. It absorbs water because of its structure. It forms a, a structure uh, with water, a complex, which means there's some link between it and water. Very, very good ideas. Not right there, but we want to get there. So I'm going to help later. But let's leave that, and then we go to the next part. How can you use this idea to make money? Remember, money, 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 money. Money is very important, right? And there are many science ideas which we are using to make money. So how can we use this particular idea to make money? How can we use to make a commercial product? How can we use this idea to make a commercial product? That will give us a lot of money. Can you think of some examples? What? Dehumidifier. Dehumidifier, I agree. Yes, what else? Uh, literally uh, surround the uh, water tubes, the leaky ones with their substance, and yeah, big leak problem solved. I agree, I agree. You can use it in plumbing. I agree. What else? Market it as a cleaning agent for sick. Like for farming. Yeah, which means as a, as a de dehydrate, dehydrating agent, right? Okay, I agree. What else? You are missing one very important one. One very important one. That almost People all of us. The chat keeps playing diapers. Diapers. Do you think so? Who supports him? Who supports the idea support, of diapers? I support the idea. Agree. Yeah, okay, let's try. 
I have I have some diapers here. I'm going to cut it open. You can see, right? I have a, I have a, some diapers here. You know, in science, when we have an idea, we want to go ahead and confirm it, right? So I'm going to destroy this diaper. I'm going to cut it open. Then I look whatever is inside. I put it in the cup and then I put some water and then we observe. So let me do two so we have enough. And if you have time at home, you have a baby at home, you can try that. So let me bring a fresh cup. So I bring a fresh cup, you can see it's fresh and empty. Then I'm going to open up the diaper. I scrape whatever I can find inside. Then I put here. Even then, if you, if you try to shake the diaper, you see some, some crystals coming out of it. I'm going to collect all of that and I'm going to put inside the cup. And then we add our water and we see what happens. So I don't want to lose anything. I put everything together. Then I get water. Okay, I allow it to stand for a while, just like we did before. I'm going to put more if possible. What the motherfucker? Eh? You be near us. If you like, I can add more water so you can see what is happening. Okay. So we let it stand for a while, just like we did before. So now we're trying to confirm the idea of a diaper. Okay, let's see. Is it the same thing? Same idea, it works exactly the same like our, our substance works. So th those are some of the ways in which we can use this chemical. So now what I want to do is, let's go a little bit ahead and talk more about uh, this, this substance. So these are the uses, these are some of the uses. So it can be used in diapers because it absorbs a large amount of water which is found in urine. It can be used in female sanitary products because it absorbs a lot of liquid during the monthly period. It can also be used in gardening. You know, sometimes when you put water into a plant, all the water runs out. But you want the water to stay there and go to the plant slowly. That's what we call slow release. So the water can get, the, can get to the plant gradually, not all at once, and some of it get, getting spilled. Also, we can use that same idea in drug delivery. Now, if you take a certain uh, drug or certain me some medicine, what may happen is that it may go into your body in large quantities at once. Doctors don't want that. They want that the, chemi the chemical which is found in the medicine should go into your body bit by bit so it can be maintained over a long period of time. That is called slow release or long release. We can use that same idea with this chemical. You mix the two of them together, you attach the two together and the antibiotic or the, or the drug is released into your system slowly. So it, it lasts over a longer period. As somebody said, we can use it in plumbing. If you have areas where you cannot get water out of it, you can put this chemical, it absorbs the water and you take it out. But as you see in the last point, I have said we can use it in firefighting. How does it work? 
I would leave that for now. We'll come back to it later. Okay, I asked you about the, the, the chemistry of this substance. Some people said, okay, it absorbs water. It's something about the structure. It forms a link with water. That's true. But I want to put it now in real chemistry terms, in chemistry language. So what you can see is that this substance is a polymer. Look at the word polymer. What is a polymer? A polymer is a long chain substance, as you already know, called sodium polyacrylate. It is used to make hydrogels. And what are hydrogels? These are cross-linked polymers that have hydrophilic groups. What is a hydrophilic group? You all know this. It attracts water. The polymers contain carboxylic acid groups. As you can see, there are many, many, many carboxylic acid groups there. And this is why it is able to absorb a lot of water molecules. Normally, this substance is coiled. And it's simple chemistry. Sodium polyacrylate, when you put it in water, is going to release the sodium. And then you have the carboxylate group. Now, because of that, the carboxylate groups, which are negative, are going to start repelling each other. So this coiled substance is going to start straightening up. Once it straightens up, you're going to have lots and lots of those negative groups. Therefore, water molecules, the positive ends of water molecules, are going to get attracted to this substance. And they will form what we call hydrogen bonds. That is the link somebody was talking about. He did not use hydrogen bonds, but I understood what the person was saying. So that's essentially what happens. Because this substance has so many of the carboxylate group, it can be able to attract so many water molecules. So you see how a very simple idea can be very, very useful to us. So what is the starting point? The science. We need to understand the chemical. We need to understand how it works. And we need to apply it to the technology and make it very useful to us. So now I, I, I go a little bit further. In the last uh, of the uses, we said we can use it in firefighting. There's a little story here. A firefighter called John Bartlett was in a fire. When he entered the house, he realized that there was a diaper which was not burnt. Everything was burnt except for the diaper. And that began some research. And what did they get out of this research? I'm not going to explain this to you. I want you to think about it and watch the video, but keep in mind the idea of the fire triangle. So watch the video. Fire needs three things to burn. It needs heat, it needs fuel, and it also needs oxygen, which is in the air. Fires burn when these three things come together. Removing any one of these three things will make the fire go out. If you add water, this takes away the heat. If you smother the fire with a fire blanket or pot lid, you take the oxygen away. If you rake the leaves and grass away, you remove the fuel and the fire will go out. This is the fire triangle. So, in brief, what are we saying here? We are trying to say that hydrogels are what we call smart materials. And what are smart materials? These are materials that will change the structure or behavior according to concentration, pH value, or temperature. So we find here this salt, sodium polyacrylate, which changes its behavior when we put it in water. This is why science is important. We want to understand the things around us. We want to understand their structures and see how they can make life useful to us. So this is a very simple example. And we think that at the Faculty of Science, it's our job to bring you into this so you can make a better future for, for the world, especially now that we're facing Wakanda forever. of coronavirus. <laughs>
if you are able to understand the science behind these virals and chemicals, then also we can be able to get a treatment. So to conclude, we see that when we understand science, and what is science? The world around us, which for example, if we understand the salt, we can use it to build technology, which is something useful to us. And we find that it is a linked structure. So science to technology back to us, or science directly to us, then to technology, whichever way you want to look at it. I think our time is limited. We can leave it here. You can have the PowerPoint. Spend more time to talk about it amongst yourselves. Thank you. Is there anyone wants to ask any questions to Dr. Akko? So you can also type in the chat or you can simply unmute yourself and ask. Thank you. Feel free, unmute and ask and talk. We want people to speak out. Any question? Nobody wants to talk. There's a question There's a about, question. Okay. is there a limit to how much water can be absorbed and how is this measured? Okay. Who can answer that? Can somebody answer that question? Would there be a limit? What do you think? Yes, there will be a limit depending on the number of carboxylate groups there. Uh, you can try this out. There's a simple experiment that you can do by adding water to a specific amount. But the theory is that one gram of, of this substance can absorb 800 grams of, of water. So 800 times its weight. That's the idea. But it may not absorb 800 grams of urine, which is close to a liter, because urine contains other substances already dissolved in it. So it may not absorb as much as that. Good question. Another question? One or two more? How would you manufacture it? Or like, is it expensive to manufacture if carboxylate group is already quite reactive? Say it again. How would you manufacture it if the carboxylate group is already quite reactive? Like, how do you get it to polymerize? Oh, the substance is already there in nature. We already have long uh, groups, right? It's simple organic reactions. So what do you do is you can start from even an, an alkane, you convert it to an, to, an, to an alcohol. If you have a long group substance, uh, you, you convert to an alcohol, you convert to a carboxylic acid, then you convert to a carboxylate. Converting to a carboxylate is very simple because it's simple acid-based reaction. A simple carboxylate, uh, think about the simple chemistry. If you want to form a salt, what do you need? A base and an acid, right? So you already have an organic acid. An organic acid plus a base, for example, sodium hydroxide, is going to give you sodium carboxylate. So it's so easy to do. This is not complicated. Many of the science around us is not difficult to do. The problem is we don't just know about it. And that is why we have to keep on looking. That is what science is all about. We keep looking for explanation. But how do you get from the carboxylate uh, molecule by itself to the polymer? Oh, you already have long chain substances. So you can convert them along with, if you have a long chain alkene, you can convert it to a long chain <laughs> to a long chain carboxylic acid, and then to the carboxylate. Very, very simple. There are, there are chemical steps for that. We don't have time to evaluate that. Thank and, you. and I don't really want uh, us to make it look cumbersome for the lower uh, students. Okay? But it's, it's very simple. You understand this as you go ahead. Another one last question. We're running out of time. There's someone asking, is it possible to reverse this absorption process? Very good question. Very, 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 very good question. Normally, when I do this uh, demonstration, when there's a lot of time, I ask students how we can retrieve the salt. Is it possible to retrieve the salt, especially in a world where we are very conscious about the environment, instead of just dumping it and wasting it, and going to manufacture a new one, yes, it's a very good idea. 
what you can do is you can simply reverse the reaction by adding salt, common salt, sodium chloride. If you add a lot of sodium chloride, you push the equilibrium back to the sodium carboxylate and you, and you can recrystallize your salt and you can use it without going to manufacture a new one. Very good question, very, very good. Okay, thank you, Dr. Arkham. So for now, we will finish um, this first lecture and then, so for now, we will um, invite Dr. Pickett to start his lecture. So Dr. Pickett, please. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'll just share the screen. Okay, so today we're going to be kind of discussing what, why animals talk, okay? And so I've got a couple examples here of animals. We call it calling um, when we talk about animals rather than talk, but uh, some examples here of animals calling. So here's a frog um, who could call very, very loudly, and I'll show you this frog calling in a bit. Uh, and also a, uh, a turn here. Okay, who's calling uh, amongst a bunch of other birds, but also to the other terns. And so uh, I want to ask this question of why do animals talk? Uh, and we'll go through some examples of, of why this is the case. Um, but I also want to ask a kind of more interesting question um, when we're thinking about evolution. And that is, uh, why do they sound the way that they sound? Uh, and this gets into a lot of really interesting questions about uh, behavior as well as um, uh, yeah behavior as well as uh, uh, kind of e ecological niche so this idea of a niche that you probably have studied a bit uh, depending on what what part of biology you've studied so far um, and how animals kind of fit together within a an environment so yeah this is our question how do why do these animals talk and uh, why do they sound how they sound? So we'll answer this first question first. Um, and there are a few different reasons, but you can probably categorize them into kind of two major groups, right? So one is about safety, right? So a lot of animals talk to each other to keep each other safe, particularly within a family. So for example, um, You've probably seen this bird here before. It's a red whiskered bulbul. It's very, very common in Hong Kong. Uh, and they are calling all the time. You hear them making noises all the time. And the noises they're making uh, are often this uh, family chatter, just to say basically that each individual is saying, I'm okay, I'm safe, don't worry about me. Uh, and the reason for that means that they can continue, you know, going through the trees or through the bushes, uh, not worrying about, uh, just a sec, hold on. Here we go. Uh, not worrying about their family members whilst they're looking for food and so on. And so I'll, I'll play one of these calls. Uh, so this is a, uh, just a kind of family chatter amongst these uh, uh, these birds, and it might be some that one that you're actually familiar with, right? So, can everyone hear that? Can everyone just make sure? Can someone tell me if they can hear that or not? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, they're making this call, and they do it periodically usually every few seconds, just to make sure everybody's safe. Um, and so we've got here a representation of that sound. And we, uh, this is called a waveform. So I'm gonna quickly explain what this looks like because we we'll use it quite a bit throughout the rest of the talk. So a waveform is a way to represent some sound recording that you have. So this is the one that we just listened to. Uh, and so that recording was 12 seconds long. And so the X axis along the bottom here uh, just shows the time, right? So at each second. So for example, you can see between about four and six seconds in this area here, there wasn't much sound, so it's quite blank, right? So 
that's the x-axis it's just time and on the y-axis we've got sorry we've got frequency so that's basically the pitch of the sound that you're hearing and if there's a dark spot that means there is a sound and the darker it is the louder that that frequency is okay so um if we look at this waveform here there are basically one two three four five six about seven sounds that the uh bulbul is making in that first call right and this the higher it is the higher the pitch um and so i can actually show you this in real time um i'll record myself here on i need to blank the screen because some people have uh, no, can't do it anyway uh so i'm going to record myself and you'll see the waveform being created as we do that so um, this is just normal speech and it's slightly different here, but basically the brighter the color is, the louder that frequency is. And so I have quite a deep voice. And so we're getting a lot of the lower frequencies, but I'll, I'll make some notes here and you can see the difference between kind of basic notes, right? So, ooh, ooh. Okay, and we'll pause that there. So you can see here that low note, most of the low frequencies were low. But you can see human speech is quite complex and there are a lot of bands in those frequencies up higher. They're just a bit quieter. Uh, and then in a higher pitch, you can see that the low part at the very bottom of this graph, it's a little bit hard to see, but the low part of that graph means I've cut out those lower frequencies and so it's a higher pitch sound. Um, and so that's basically the idea of these waveforms. Um, but yeah, so when these animals are talking, one of the things they're saying is, don't worry, I'm okay. Um, but also you need to have the opposite um, speech, right? So instead of saying, don't worry, I'm okay. They're saying, for example, run away. I see a predator. I see an eagle. There's a snake nearby, something like that. Um, and so families will often warn each other when there is a predator nearby. Um, now this is quite dangerous because if uh, you're, making a noise you make yourself visible to uh, other predators um, or to that predator that you're warning everybody else about um, but usually if they're in a family group it's worthwhile if they're not within a family group they may not care about everyone else uh, so a good example of this are the prairie dogs also meerkats which is uh, similar where they'll often have many members of the family keeping an eye out and looking for predators and then if they see one they'll scream uh, and they'll make a very particular noise. So this is an example of that uh, in the prairie dogs. Very cute animals. So oops, to our eyes um, or to our ears, I guess, uh, they, those two calls sound very, very similar. Um, actually, the prairie dogs are a really interesting example of uh, these warning calls because they have a language um, in that if they see an eagle, they'll say a different thing than if they see a snake or some other predator. And so their family knows how to get away from it as quickly as possible. Uh, and there has been a scientist who was looking at this who was able to decipher what they were saying. Um, and they say things such as, um, they do warn when there are humans nearby and they warn based on the color that they're wearing. So there are lots of, there's a lot of intricacy to that language. And also the language changes depending on the area. So they've kind of got accents or um, like humans do. So it's really, really interesting for that respect. So yeah, these are two main reasons animals talk with respect to um, uh, safety. And these are probably two of the most common things you'll hear because birds do both of these a lot. Um, and then also some of the mammals like this prairie dog do it as well. But because birds are doing both, you, you hear them quite a bit. Um, the other main reason animals uh, call is to find a mate. And there, again, there are kind of two oppos opposing things here. Uh, the first is basically to say, look at me, I'm attractive. Um, and it's usually a male saying this to females. Uh, so this is the vast majority of frog calls that you'll hear is a male saying, basically, uh, I'm here. Um, 
and based on his voice, the female can determine whether he's attractive or not um, and fit enough for her to mate with. Or uh, it's kind of the opposite where males are usually talking to each other and saying, go away, this is my territory. I'm trying to attract females to this spot, um, which is probably what this turn is doing. Uh, you often see seagulls or a lot of seabirds will try and kind of uh, yell at each other to get out of, uh, out of their spot. Um, and yeah, so two different things. Either come to, come to me, I'm attractive, or go away, this is my spot so I can attract other females. Um, today we're going to look mostly at frogs. Um, and the reason I want to do that is birds tend to be quite, uh, are very intelligent animals. Uh, and so they're quite complex in their behavior. Uh, whereas frogs have a tiny, tiny brain. They don't really have any intelligence much at all. Um, and so it's a bit easier to explain their behavior. And uh, frogs actually do two of these behaviors. So if they, uh, they'll have kind of a warning vocalization. It's not necessarily to their family, but just to say, to confuse their predator uh, if they get attacked. But their most complex and most interesting uh, behaviors are when there are, they're trying to um, attract a mate. And so we're going to look at this frog in particular. This is an Australian tree frog, um, which does both of these mating calls. So it does say, look at me, I'm attractive. That's what he's doing at the moment in this photo. But he also says, go away, this is my spot to other males. Um, and so I'll show you what that looks and sounds like. Uh, hopefully this works, the video works. So this is um, uh, yeah, this is the same, this or similar species to that one. Uh, so I'll press play, this can be quite loud. So just be aware of your speakers or if you have headphones on. Thank you. Okay. So somebody who was playing over that, that's actually what we do in the field. We try and get them to call sometimes by making the same noise. So this is uh, a call of this tree frog. Um, and that's the attraction call. So he's trying to attract a female with that. If you listen very carefully at the end of that, there is another kind of trilling, soft trilling noise, which goes, crew, crew, um, which is the male, it must be a nearby male that's telling this one to go away. Um, so it's kind of soft at the end there. So um, yeah, so this is the main idea um, that these frogs are calling to attract a mate. Now, I want to focus on these two uh, in particular. They're very closely related species. So they're basically the same behavior. Um, and I'm going to play a call of basically the same frog, uh, but this time it's in a huge chorus. And this brings up one of the problems for frogs that are calling uh, in their environments. And this could be quite loud, so just be careful. So, What's happening there, and you can see on this waveform, uh, is that there are about a hundred frogs calling from the one tree on that, in that case. So for whatever reason, it was a really nice night. All the male frogs thought it was a great idea to go out and call, uh, and they make a huge amount of noise. And this creates a problem because the females can't figure out which male is which. Right, because as there's so much noise, it's basically a wall of sound. They don't know how to find their male, um, and this could be good for some males, right? If you're a less uh, attractive male in their call, they might that might confuse the female and they mate with that male. And so there is kind of an advantage for some of them to do this, um, but it does create a big problem because it's really hard for the females to find the males, uh, except for the fact that there are a lot of them kind of around. So. Um, this brings up a question about why do they sound the way they do? Uh, and we're not going to look at that frog in particular. We're going to start looking at uh, what we call explosive breeders. These are uh, uh, frogs that live in the desert um, and why they've evolved to sound the way that they sound, which is very different to the frog that you just heard. 
Um, and so there are a few things that evolution can do to change the way of, uh, an animal sounds. Uh, one of them is that they can change the volume, right? You can get louder or you can get quieter. And generally for frogs, because they're trying to attract females from as far away as possible, volume isn't that interesting because it's just be as loud as you can. Um, but frequency and timing can be very interesting because they vary a lot between different species. Um, and it seems that there's a lot of kind of uh, interaction between those species as to which species gets which frequency and, and timing um, for breeding or for their uh, breeding call. And so that's what we're going to look at here. So how the frequency and timing differs between these different species. So we're going to look at desert frogs. So obviously this isn't, uh, doesn't apply to Hong Kong. We're a, we're a tropical place here. We get a lot of rain. So in Hong Kong, um, we have basically a choice of uh, 10 months where you get lots of rain uh, and lots of water lying around on the ground. Frogs can then breed because they lay their eggs in the water. The tadpoles grow and then they metamorphose and can live on the land as frogs. Um, but if you live in the desert or if a frog lives in a desert, it doesn't rain very often, right? And so in Australia, there are periods of time in a desert where it doesn't rain for two or three years or even more. Um, and so if there are frogs living there and there are lots of frogs living there, uh, they basically only have a very short amount of time in which they can breed. So the frogs that live in the desert, a lot of them will bury themselves underground and then they'll come up above ground when it rains and then they'll breed. But because they're all breeding at the same time, it's going to be all the different frogs trying to breed in, in this very short window uh, a period of time. Um, and so the big thing becomes that they need to avoid talking over the top of each other, like we saw with the uh, tree frog before. Um, and so there are a few different strategies that they can do. And these are, these are the two main ones. Uh, one is called temporal partitioning and the other one is called frequency partitioning, right? So partitioning is a pretty long word, but it's, it's pretty uh, simple concept. It's just how you break something apart so that you can share it, right? So if you've got a birthday cake and you have 10 people, you partition it into 10 pieces. Um, and so we're breaking apart here the time and we're breaking apart the frequencies that they, that they use. Um, so that they don't necessarily call on top of each other or talk over each other. Um, and so temporal partitioning is very common, right? It, pretty much every frog species does it, but they do it in maybe different ways. So in Hong Kong, because there's so much water everywhere um, and breeding period is really, really long or potential breeding period, um, some species can breed at the beginning of the wet season, some species can breed later in the wet season and so on. So if you go out you know, at night now, there'll be toads breeding, but they don't breed for the rest of the year. And that's as a way to avoid talking over other frogs. Um, but there's also frequency partitioning, which I'll, I'll show you as well. Um, and these desert frogs, because their temporal, because their breeding season is, has to be within that period after the rain, uh, they have to do temporal partitioning in a different way. Um, and so let's have a look at what that looks like. That's the wrong one. All right, so here I've got five different frogs. These are all desert frogs, and they are, um, and I'll play their calls, uh, and they are both doing temporal and frequency partitioning. All right, so I'll play them first so you can hear what they sound like. So this is the first frog. All right, that's. Uh, yeah, so that's the first one. So this one's the second one. You'll notice that the frequency changes a little bit. So it's a slightly higher sounding call. Okay, and now we'll do the next one. This one, if you can tell by the waveforms, uh, you can predict that this is probably going to be pretty similar to the last one. It's a bit lower. Uh, and then we've got another one here, and we can see that that one's going to be quite low. And now we'll have a final one. Again, this one's probably quite low, and there's other frogs in the background that you can hear as well, which is actually quite interesting to show exactly what I'm talking about. So that was two frogs. One sounded like an owl is kind of going, hoot. 
And the other one was uh, calling in the background. Similar sound to the one that we listened to before. All right, so one thing you might notice if we're talking about temporal partitioning, right, sharing that t available time uh, is that these frogs have very short calls, right? So that video that we saw before, this guy has a call that goes about five or six or seven seconds long. It's a really long call. Um, but because every frog wants to breed at the same time, having a really long call means you're going to be talking over each other. And so the way that they deal with that is to have a really short call. And so I can look at this in this software. If I highlight the length or highlight that call, it shows me that it is 0 0.25 seconds long. Right, so really short. Some of them are slightly longer, but one of the ways that they deal with not over talking each other is to have a very short call. Um, and so that works even within the species. So if you've got lots of other frogs that have the same frequency as you because they're the same species, you can talk, uh, have a short call so that they don't uh, overlap. And the other way that they do it is by having that different frequency. And we can see that, right? So some of these frogs like this one here have a really low frequency. And some of them have, this one I think is the highest one, have a really high frequency. And so unlike humans, in, for us, we, we can hear a huge variety of frequencies. We can hear from very low to very high. But frogs can target what they listen to or what they hear. And so the females can target uh, this higher frequency for this higher species of frog, right, so that the females can only hear that higher frequency. And then the, another species of frog can only hear this lower frequency. And so that they, when it's uh, just rained and there's lots, millions of frogs out on, in the water, um, they don't hear most of those other frogs because they're only listening to that one frequency. And so it's a lot less loud and a lot less noisy for them. Um, yeah, so find it, there we go. So that's the main idea here is that essentially the environment is able to drive that sound of that call. So uh, for example, if the breeding season has to be short because there's only a certain amount of water or rain, uh, that leads to generally shorter calls. Um, but also they need to find this frequency niche, right? Find the part of the frequency that uh, spectrum for sounds that isn't taken up by other species. And if it's a new species to that area, they might have to evolve to change their frequency to fit within um, whatever is available based on what are the frogs that are around. Uh, and that seems to be what happens with a lot of these um, frogs that call in a very short period of time. Okay, so I think that's all for uh, the talk. Are there any questions that we can have? Okay, I'll choose one from the uh, comments. So there's... All right, so somebody asked, does the temperature affect the sound? So uh, it's a good question for, it depends on um, the species you're looking at. So for frogs, because they're cold-blooded animals, um, they are very affected by the temperature. So they do sometimes get affected by the sound. For mammals and birds, you wouldn't have much of an effect. But so for, for example, some frogs, their muscles don't work as well. So they'll often have a much slower call when it's colder, or it might be a bit lower sounding. Um, it probably doesn't have a huge impact on whether they attract a female or not, because the female will come when they're ready to call. Uh, but yeah, it definitely affects their muscles. So they, they can't usually make the call as quickly as possible as they normally would. Um, what else have we got here? How do they target at a certain frequency? So this is more um, over a very long period of time uh, as they're evolving for that environment. Um, there will be basic natural selection. So um, the males and the females have to select kind of simultaneously, but they'll, they'll um, if 
a certain male calls at a frequency and they get more, more mates because of that, uh, because they're not being overshadowed by other frogs, that they'll uh, reproduce more and therefore they'll produce more offspring. Those offspring will have a different frequency call and that will continue uh, happening over time until they fit that frequency. So, um, yeah, it's more about evolution rather than the frogs choosing a particular call. They have that call from birth, uh, well, from the first time that they do a mating call, and they basically keep that unless they grow and you can change the frequency slightly. Uh, can we imitate mating calls? A human voice to make calls frog in love with us. We can imitate mating calls and the frogs will respond. Um, usually it's a way of telling us to get out of their territory. Um, but it's very useful if you're trying to find frogs for scientists. We do that all the time. Is there a difference between frog noises you would imitate in the lab to real sounds from frogs? Say if you're doing an experiment using a recording of the frog. Um, so basically you try and uh, imitate the frog as much as possible. So yeah, if you record another frog and, and play it back, then um, usually that'll be enough to get them to call back. You can do different experiments. So often we do experiments to see what female frogs like. So you might record a frog and then change the frequency by computer and see if they like a lower call or like a higher call or they like the, you know, the medium. Um, often with frogs, the females like the lower call because it means the male is slightly bigger, which means they've lived for longer. So they know that they can survive for a long time and get food. But yeah, um, it depends on what you're trying to do in the lab or out in the field. If you're just trying to get them to call, just try and make the same frequency noise and it usually works. Um, I work with some, I've worked with friends who have worked on this one frog. It doesn't have external ears, so it doesn't really hear very well. So you just yell hello frog at them uh, and it works. They call back. Okay. Um, do frogs call. respond to the vibration of the call as well if they cannot hear it as you mentioned? Yeah. So we think that's how they hear when we yell hello frog, it's just vibrating the ground at that frequency and then they respond to that. Um, so yeah, they, we think it goes up through their arms. We're not entirely sure about that, but that's what we think is happening. Okay, thank you. Someone asked, um, do frogs undergo voice changes like through different phases of their life? They will get, if they so frogs all continue growing their whole life. So they grow really fast when they're young and then they'll grow really slowly for the rest of their life. So they get really, they can get really big. Um, and because they're using resonance, right? So if we look back at um, uh, the picture of the frog, hold on, I can share that screen again. Um, right, so they're using resonance so in their vocal sac. So if they're bigger, they'll have a, a bigger, uh, a lower resonance frequency. So it'll actually be a deeper voice. Uh, and yes, usually females seem to prefer that deeper voice. But not, not a big change, not like us when we go through puberty or something like that. Uh, any Excuse other questions? Yep. Uh, how do we know that what are the animals talking about what yes uh, when you talk of, when you mention at the first of the lecture that we know that the animals are talking to the family that don't worry I'm okay uh, are we just knowing that by the frequencies of the voice uh, no it's more from uh, observing them in nature and seeing uh, trying to observe or correlate the a behavior with the call that they're making. So if we see that, you know, there is a predator around and that animal has seen a predator and that's the call that they make, then we can say, okay, that's what they're trying to say. Um, so it's trying to figure out, you know, what behavior they're doing associated with that call. Um, it's a bit harder for the, it's okay. I'm safe thing. Um, but you do notice that if they're not safe, they'll stop that call. Uh, and then also, Pending, I think with these species, uh, I don't study birds as much as frogs, but uh, that if they stop making that call, then they'll start to, the parents will start to panic, for example. So yeah, it's just, it takes a lot of observation out in the wild. Thank you.
Um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Um, I would like to ask: Can we um, have this experiment in the indoors area, not in the nature? You can. It's it's sometimes hard with animals because if you take them out of nature, their behavior changes, uh, often because they get stressed. Um, and so some, some frogs will be very uh, unwilling to uh, call inside. Other frogs don't care. Uh, it really depends on the species. So um, yeah, you can. I think they're asking for that to be the final question. Um, if there's no more questions, then um, probably we will um, end the lecture here. Sorry, may I ask one more question? Um, one final quick one then, <laughs> thank you. Um, regarding the frogs, can the predators learn what noises frogs are making or other animals and use that to their advantage, like to make use of the frogs that are vulnerable? Uh, yes. Uh, so. Uh, I've mentioned before that most frogs have a very narrow frequency that they listen to depending on the male's mating call. There are some frogs that eat other frogs. They have a wider, um, they can listen to a wider frequency band because they're trying to listen to all the frogs that they can eat. Um, snakes probably listen through vibration because they don't have ears. Uh, so like the other smaller frogs. Um, but yeah, it is, it's a, it's a very big risk for them to be calling. And so, they have to get the advantage of reproduction out of it. Okay, thank you Dr. Akum and also Dr. Pickett to share the lectures with us today. And thank you all for joining. So thank you, have a nice day.